Is this your king, Jabari Osase? party people in the place to be go by the name of the bk apologist transmitting all the way live from new york is the city Brooklyn is the borough was good what's popping um yeah it's monday hope everybody had a great uh memorial day weekend uh you know those of us who have served our country we just want to salute you you know regardless of where you lie within the political spectrum i feel like we need to support our troops you know and we appreciate everything you have done and continue to do for us, right? So I want to just put that out there. And, of course, we got to say what up to the party people in the chat. We got to Enya Kenya. Am I saying that correct? If I'm not, please forgive me. We got Shadi Mills in the building, Prime Minister 66. We got KJ. We got Tyler Lott, Bars and Scripps. We got Michelle Turner. We got DSC in the check-in. We got the incomparable, the indelible Nate 2 d 2 in the place to be and of course as always if you have not yet already please like share and subscribe please put this link out to your various corners of the interweb so people know that we are in here about to do business and if you like how it goes down with the bk you can give a little digital donation in the paypal and if you like to be a monthly supporter of bk you can Become a patron where you get an assortment of goodies to enhance your personal Bible study. And, of course, I have my cohort, partner in crime, from the other side of the Mason-Dixon, none other than Mr. MJ Jackson. What's going on, sir? Hat tip to you, BK. Uh, grace and peace to the uh, chat on this wonderful holiday evening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is this your king series continues? Continues. And, you know, I, I kind of forgot about this particular individual because we've done so much videos on this person already. But, you know, he is somebody who is uh, very influential in the conscious community. So I'm like, well, you know, we, we have to, you know, spend just, just a little bit of time, you know, talk about a couple of things, you know. And, you know, I, I appreciate Jabari because he, he's he's a mature man. <laughs> you know, he 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 holds himself well. You know, he's willing to to publicly debate. You know, um, he doesn't go into the mud and sling mud. I mean, he'll throw the occasional shot, but that's cool. You know, it's all it's all love when it comes to that. So I definitely appreciate him having a thick skin. And knowing that it's about information and, and it's never personal over here with us. You know what I mean? But with that being said, there's some things we would like to, to you know, look at when it comes to Mr. Osase. So um, before we do, though, right, uh, MJ, what are your thoughts um, concerning our our friend, Mr. Osase? Mm, what are my thoughts? Well, yeah, I would second most of the things that you've said. Uh, Jabari uh, Osaze, you know, points to, to his audience that he's both a priest and occasionally he'll put his historian hat on. Right. So, uh, you know, we want to see what that, that uh, Ivy League degree is worth uh, tonight. You know, he will let us know that he, you know, he will march out his pedigree. Uh, in terms of having studied at the feet of, um, you know, Yosef Ben Yakinen and you know uh, John Henry Clark and you know all all of the uh, Pan Africanist ilk and uh, yep. so you know we want to see what that's about. Um, but like I said, I do respect the man. Um, I admire um, how he can carry himself in. In a, in a, you know, in in those circles over there, yes, uh, where yes, where self discipline can be lacking. Uh, so shout out to him, but you know, uh, I've wanted to interact with his material uh, in a in a more um, 
you know, in a more uh, prolonged uh, uh, fashion. And uh, here it is. Definitely. Here it is. So with that. All right, sir. Um, five minute mark. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Um, and so going into that tradition, I initially first started studying at the Saraset Society, which is probably the largest um, comedic uh, uh, gathering. They have chapters all over the world. They're very quiet. So if you don't know they're there, you don't know they're there. But they are. there are many, many different places around the world. Um, and uh, I didn't end up staying there um, entirely. I, I ended up leaving there and going to... Um, the, the Shrine of Patah, which was founded and led by Baba Heru Ankh Ra Samad Se Patah. Some folks online have seen him. Um, Baba Heru was an elder, one of the first people to bring these ancient traditions to the West. And so he's my elder. He's been my elder since I was initiated in 1998. Um, he's um, someone that I, I hold in, in the deepest possible esteem. Um, he's like a family member, really, at this point. Um, he's he's been part of my um, my support group since before 2000. I mean, just think about how long um, he's been part of my life. And um, in the shrine of Patah, people either chose their own names after considering no, what here. the journey they're on meant to them, or they also my got bad. assistance from the. Thank you. I was, click I was clicking on the wrong screen. It's all good. So. You know, it's an interview, and he's kind of giving you, you know, the life of times of Jabari Osase, you know, the, the origin story, if you will. And he mentions that he was part of the Osal Osset Society, right? Now, you heard him say that. Now, without the context, you would just say, okay, he was part of this society, and that's fine. Well, if you've been tracking on my channel for the last year and a half, you know me and MJ have been really digging deep into the origins of some of these societies, that they claim to be very, you know, ancient and African in their teachings. Well, with that being said, the Osa Society was formed by R.A. Strong, known by his religious name, Raoun Nefer Amen, a member during the 1970s of the Rosicrucian Anthroposophic League. Say that again, Doc. The Rosicrucian Anthroposophic League. Mm. A black man, Strong became an occult teacher to the black community and around 1980 established an independent organization that applied the universal occult truths of Rosicrucianism to the Afro-American situation. Strong has written several occult texts, the realization of Neternu, health teachings of the age of wisdom, and meditation techniques of the Kabbalists, Vatinus, and Taoists. So this is the society that um, our good friend Jabari was a part of. And later on in the video, you will hear he was, he was there for at least a good eight years. So this is not an African teaching. This is Rosicrucianism draped in kente cloth and a kufi. That's what this is. And not that we care what he believes. He's free to believe whatever he wants. But it's that, you know, in his community... We get accused of, of participating in a white man's religion. But every time we, you know, we, we peek through the blinders over there, the white man just pops out. Just, just keep popping out. Peekaboo, peekaboo. Hey, <laughs> white man here. You know, so um, now let's look a little bit more. Up. And why is it so, you know, important to understand that the Osa society is black Rosicrucianism. Well, <clears throat> even as Hermeticism faded, replacements appeared on the horizon. One made its debut in 1614 when a series of texts were published touting the mysteries of Christian Rosicruz. His uncorrupted body was supposedly discovered clutching a book of his sacred teachings, secret teachings, the Order of the Rosy Cross, a secret group committed to these teachings. We're now ready to reform the world. Authorship of these texts have always been debated, but they likely originated in circles that included Valentin Andre and Tobias Hess. 
The entire account of Christian Rosencruz was fictional. He never existed. There was no order of the Rosy Cross, and the story was partly based upon a satirical work by Torino Bossolini. Despite a dubious lineage, the text provided impetus for later Rosicrucian movements, like the one Jabari was in, claiming a supposed descent from the original followers. The text was a sensation, and many wished to join the fictional order. So people knew it was fake, and they still wanted to be down. They still wanted to be down. So, and they, you know, they talk about how, well, Jesus didn't exist. Well, Roshan Cruz didn't exist. It was fictional. It was satire. And people knew it, and they still became part of this group. And somehow this made its way to Harlem under the guise of the Arsaw Asset Society, where basically Jabari was initiated in his, you know, walk into what he believes to be comedic religion. MJ, your thoughts? Well, hmm, I mean, this this is kind of similar to it, in my opinion, to what Wallace uh, Farad Muhammad did. You know, he, you know, word on the street is he wasn't black. <laughs> 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 okay word on the street he wasn't black but he um he took what he learned um and he brought it to to a people starved for identity right we're talking about black people here and you know we have a unique history african americans have a unique history here in america uh, where we were brought here we did not migrate here we were brought here stripped of our language, our, um, you know, our culture, and forced to become one culture. But the thirst for identity and culture still persisted. Well, um, this gentleman who was a part of the, the Asar Asset Society, the Asar Society, uh, came and took this, uh, this product of, of Europe and dressed it in kente cloth, as Alfredo said, and and really flipped it, so to speak, uh, to and packaged it for African American people. And you know, I wonder how how that benefited him. I'm pretty sure it did. You know, you look at all the the cult leaders; they seem to be doing pretty good. Uh, but the you know the the unfortunate thing is. You know, a falsehood has been passed on to the African American people, and that's that's unfortunately sad. Once again, uh, it's therapeutic mythology. Yes, the therapeutic mythology. It, it's a it's a reimagined blackness from the lens of speculative fiction. That's what it is. All right. So to continue, let's go, MJ. If you could go to the eleven minute mark, sir. Absolutely. as I did my study, that that institution was not disconnected from the entire history of Christianity and what happened to people of African descent. So as I continued to learn, there was a point where I realized that I was no longer a Christian. And that was a very, very difficult moment. It was a, it literally happened at a moment um, that I realized that I was not going to be the same um, person. So to some degree, some of that training began while I was still a Christian. Mm -hmm. I'd started studying history. I'd started studying, well, what does, what did spirituality look like before Christianity? What did Africans do? How is it that I got to where I, where I am? What happened in my lineage, my direct lineage, and in the, the, the recent and a bit more distant history of people of African descent in the West. As I continued to study that, I got to the point where I had begun to, in many ways, I wouldn't have called it that then, but I, I began to be a practitioner. I began to recognize the movements of the heavens and the movements of the stars as a divine, as above and so below. Um, that, that the way that we should look at 
the the this cosmic journey that we're on yeah, and it. draw inspiration. So to answer the yes, yes, he was um, a Roman Catholic. He went to Catholic school in Queens. Uh, 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 most of his education actually was a uh, Catholic school until he went to college. So, yeah, he, he br he'll bring it up, you know, if you listen to him talk about his origin, you know, so it's not like a secret or anything. He's, he, he grew up uh, Roman Catholic. So he said something very interesting, right? Now, mind you, he's talking about Asian African Christian, you know, beliefs, you know, but then he says something very interesting. He says, as below, as above, so below. Where have we heard that before? Well, two fingers on the right hand point up and two on the left hand point down, meaning as above, so below. These words and accompanying gesture are familiar to occultists. They are drawn from the ancient works of Hermes Trismegistus, whose writings became popular during the Renaissance and Reformation. In reality, Hermes Trismegistus was a Hellenistic creation and most of the celebrated texts associated with this supposed Egyptian sage post-dated the New Testament. Thus, this view of Egypt was totally baseless, but this was not known until after it had molded the consciousness of the West. And we actually seen him in his last debate, uh, well, the debate that was supposed to happen with Garfield. He has quoted Hermes specifically, right? So this is, again part of you know his understanding of what he believes to be ancient egyptian religion but as we see here it he was a hellenistic creation he didn't exist hermes didn't exist and roshan cruz didn't exist so that's two people that's very much monumental in his quote-unquote spiritual journey that don't exist but then he'll turn around and say that jesus didn't exist right so, um, yeah, so anything you want to say before we um, we continue, sir? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's looking like the emperor has no clothes. And, you know, as you pointed out earlier, um, you know, we went on this journey uh, to get behind the origins of the conscious community. Um, and I think it started, what, late 2021? And... You know, we carried that over, but yeah, Hermes Tres um, Majestus. Tres Majestus. <laughs> you know, is is a is is once again a fictional character. It's, it's a creation um, from 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 Europeans, and once again, we are projecting that back on African people. Why? Well, therapy. I don't want to psychologize this stuff, but, uh, and I'm not going to, I just think that, um, I think that it lacks evidence of being true. I'm just going to just, you know, keep it philosophical. It, uh, it lacks evidence of being true. So when something is not true, you can continue to believe it if you want to. You just, you know, you, you lack a factual basis, which to base that belief upon. And okay, that's fine. But when you start coming for Christianity, these are the type of things that can happen. This, this is very true. Very true. And with that, it's going to keep on happening. So, sir, if you can go to the 13-minute mark, please, if you will. Big up to Phil Fox. Thank you, sir. Definitely appreciate the love. You know I mean? 90 when it became clear to me um, I read several books, but the one that really set me on the journey that turned the light bulb on or in some ways opened another door to me, that book was uh, Christianity um, Christianity Before Christ. I'm looking for my version that I have of it uh, by John G. Jackson. I'm not sure how many of you have read that book, but it is um, it's an amazing text. And it was um, in some ways jarring when i completed the, the the book and i had connected what i was reading to the other things i was studying i began to recognize that i could no longer do what i had done that i was different now it wasn't my intent 
but it happened. And I remember reading the book, finishing the book, and dropping it right where it was. I was standing in my dorm room, 1990, a freshman at Cornell. I dropped the book where it was, and I literally walked out of the building into the, into the snow. I didn't put on my coat. I didn't put on my boots. I didn't put on a hat. No scarf, no glove. I just walked into the snow. It was really a jarring moment where I was questioning what I knew about who I was, what I knew about how I and the people that had come before me got to this place to where we are. Stop it, here. it was it was frightening. So again, you know, we're getting a lot of great insight in the life of times of, of Mr. Osasse, you know. So now this is prior to him going to the Osar uh Osage Society. So this is basically this is Peter Parker getting bit by the radioactive spider moment for him, right? This is a, as he said, jarring. This was something that resonated. It was paradigm shifting, this this work from, from John G. Jackson, right? So let's, let's just look at Mr. Jackson here for a second. Uh, this is from Afrocentrism, Mythical Past and Imagined Homes by Stephen Howe. Good book. This, yeah, very good book. Especially, an especially interesting case is the use made by Afrocentrists by writings of Albert Churchward, and an English medical man, ardent Freemason, and amateur Egyptologist. Writing in the first decades of the century, he is cited as an authority by such figures as Malafia Sante, John G. Jackson, and Henry Olea, and repeatedly by Yosef Ben Yakum. Uh, if you know anything about Albert Churchward from our previous videos, he knows that he cites her Maestris Magistus quite a bit, you know, and that these guys quoting, you know, quoting from him, they're quoting from Hermes. Okay. This is the guy that, that caused, you know, Jabari to walk into the snow. Uh, Jackson's own much later magnum opus carrying the same main title as his and Huggins predecessor introduction to African civilizations and to a limited degree based on it appeared in 1970 Jackson's work like that of Chancellor Williams or J.A. Rogers, is an uneasy mixture of acidaceous independent scholarship and wild fantasy. Though with far less of the latter than there is in Williams' writing, or that of several younger, younger Afrocentrists, Jackson certainly exhibits some of the now familiar faults of this kind of history writing. An indiscriminate use of sources, including reliance on mystical and global diffusionist speculation by the likes of Albert Churchward and Gerald Massey, romantic inflation of the glories of past African kingdoms. All right. This man is his books. Again, it's a reimagining of blackness right now. Blackness itself is a social construct, right? And the current reality of blackness is not an easy one just to say the least, right? So what people like him have done is given a alternative. You know, it's a reimagining of blackness through speculative fiction. Something like, listen, you don't know, but you come from an ancient people from a glorious and distant land. We and were now kings! That you know, right, now that you know who you are, it's time to take your rightful place and eke out your revenge against those who have caused all this disdain. Now, you can swap out that place with Africa, Israel, Morocco. It doesn't really matter. But again, it's it's a reimagining, a reimagining of blackness. This is what is being peddled, okay, by people like uh, Mr. Jackson. Other parts of Jackson's work, especially those which deal with the more recent past, are merely romanticized rather than wholly fantastic. His yet more ambitious man, God and Civilization, similarly makes lucid and vigorous attacks on targets ranging from organized religion to Eurocentric his histo historiography with a reliance on sources that were at best dated as at worst, as with Churchward, Godfrey, Higgins, and Jackson's greatest hero, Gerald Massey, downright eccentric. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> look at the stuff that this guy is using, 
You know, and again, if you've seen our other videos, I don't want to, you know, keep repeating ourselves, but again, Gerald Massey relied heavily on stuff from the your corpus from Medicum. You know, and a guy who didn't exist. You know, uh, a corpus of literature that was nothing more than Greco-Roman fanboy fiction of ancient Egypt. Not Egypt itself, not the actual indigenous people of Kemen. Right? This is the stuff that they were looking for and used. And to this day, people are still using these sources. Again, it's a it's a reimagining of blackness via the lens of speculative fiction. Now, for believers like ourselves, you know, we we also deal with the construct of blackness. But the thing is, the, one of the side effects of the gospel is that we deal with the actual reality of the state of blackness today. Like we actually deal with it. We don't we don't do this. Well, what if we was from this other? We don't do that. We deal with the current state. Right now, the gospel isn't specifically for that. But when you align yourself with King Jesus, one of the side effects is you dealing with the actual state of blackness and not some fanciful alternative escapism. Right. As much as they like to say Christianity is just, you know, pie in the sky. Historically, when you look at the church, yes, we are a supernatural body of people, but we're very much grounded on terra firma. Like we here, <laughs> we deal with what's going on in this planet and we fight to, to bring God here through the gospel. You know, MJ. Yeah, um, you know, I, I have a, a fondness for John G. Jackson a little bit, and I too <laughs> have that book, okay, by John G. Jackson. I too <laughs> have the pagan <laughs> origins of the Christ myth, um, and yet I, I'm still a Christian, <laughs> um, I'm still a Christian. Uh, because once again, for a lot of the same reasons uh, that that BK just mapped out, uh, if you use a good historical method, right, and you look into these sources um, that John G. Jackson was using, it shouldn't shake you. It shouldn't shake you. It, it shouldn't. Um, if you're not aware of how to do historiography, it's okay to have questions, but I don't think that you should sit there after one reading of a, a bad source because you got a lot of bad sources. Um, you know, you I'm, I'm looking for some bad sources in here. <laughs> they, they, they they on the hotel shelf back there. Nah. <laughs> but you got a lot of bad sources. And here's the thing: if, if something is said to be true. It should be able to under uh, to undergo rigorous scrutiny, right? It was nothing, and, and and no, no, you know, he he was a young dude at the time, right? No disrespect to him. There was nothing rigorous uh, about what happened. Nothing rigorous about this book, right? It's, it it seems to be a repackaging. Of the 16 crucified saviors, I've mm. seen this mm. somewhere, and it just once again looks to be repackaged for black people. Uh, and and John G. Jackson is being a good capitalist, he's being a good capitalist. Mm. That's the thing with America, you have a market for all kinds of BS. Excuse my language. You, 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 you have a market for the anti-social justice people. You have the market for the anti-CRT people. You have the market for the anti-Christian people. You, you have a market for uh, stuff just like this. And what John G. Jackson was doing is like, hey, and this is probably not his motive. This is just what I see with a lot of these uh, people uh, is that they tapped into that market. And one of the unfortunate... Um, one of the unfortunate things is people like Jabari Osase walked away from uh, from the faith. Right. I mean, it 
in, in, a, in a sense, he, he kind of is a victim yeah. of, of this reimagined blackness. You know, because there was, there was a hole in him, right? The same hole that, that's in all of us, right? But And we want it to be filled, but it got to be filled with the right thing. And, 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 and it's a God-shaped hole. Only God can fill it, you know? But these other things are trying to fill and replace something that only God can fill. So he was somebody who was sincere. I believe he's very sincere. And when he read this book, it, it was it was jarring for him. It was a paradigm shift for him. But unfortunately, he was sold a false bill of goods. He was basically victimized by the very book that caused him to, you know, such such jarring. You know, but let, let me say, yeah. let me just, John G. Jackson deserves his own "Is This Your King" uh, segment. But let me <laughs> let me just read this, right? Okay. And this is on page one sixty six. Gerald Massey and his school have argued persuasively for for Egyptian origin of Christianity, claiming that the whole of Christian Bible, Old and New Testament, are traceable to religious records in ancient Egypt. Massey presented his opinions backed up by impressive documentation. I cannot discuss these works at length, for that will require a book in itself. However, Massey did publish a book of 10 lectures the most important being the historical Jesus and the mythical Christ. I shall discuss this work briefly. Okay, so let me just say this about Matt, Massey's 10 lectures. Jackson is citing Massey as a source, but when we go to check Massey's work, and I got a big book by Massey and his lectures on the BS shelf, mm -hmm. um, when, we, when, we, when we go to check his citations, there aren't any. He says, take my word for it, basically. Wow. So just here's the thing. I appreciate Jackson telling us where he got his stuff from. Absolutely. Right? Because I can go look up, look the crap up. Or I can call BK and say, hey, look, do you have this? And he can shoot <laughs> that to me. But when we go to check the stuff, you're asking me to have blind faith in you. And I'm just not willing to, to play these types of games. And that's the type of stuff that's in this book. Wow. And people go take issue that the man is dead while y'all picking on him. Like, hey, this is the type of stuff that people were that people are reading and walking away. So yeah, I mean, yeah, we gotta say something. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It it changed this man's trajectory in his whole life from this book. Yeah, we gotta address that. That's crazy. So Sir, if you can now go to the 26 minute mark. 26 minuto. Traditions, because they say that this tra their traditions are monotheistic, right? Um, I truly believe it's a distinction that is not a value-based distinction. But many who are practicing the Abrahamic traditions have made it sound like they are the evolution of human spiritual practice. Like, you know, people were doing some things and eventually we found our way into the right way, which is monotheism. That's kind of how it gets described sometimes, you know. Um, but I'll honestly say to you, true monotheism or true, true polytheism doesn't exist, right? In ancient Kemet, there is clearly, as you've mentioned, the concept that there was one divine force. There is one divine force. And that one divine force operates in specific manners based on the situation. And so if this divine force is all things, is everything, how do you name something that is all things? How can you describe the ceiling if the ceiling and the floor are the same? All right, you stop that. How would you describe it? And you know, we've heard him use that um metaphor um before. So, you know, this this force, he believes in this force that permeates through everything, right? The chair, including the chair and the ceiling. I think and Star Wars got it right. <laughs> I mean, when no, when when Obi-Wan first explains the force to Luke, it's basically the same premise. Yeah. It's the same premise. 
um, it's it's pantheism. It's pantheism. We got a it's word pantheism. for that. Yes, we do. Pantheism. And pantheism has a lot of problems. But go Lots ahead. Of problems. Lots of problems, which we've we've dealt with in the past. But again, this idea of these many modes, right? These are. They, it, it wasn't that they had multiple gods. It wasn't that they had a pantheon. It was one force in many modes and in, in symbols. Now, again, sounds interesting, but is that indigenous comedic belief? Where do they, and it's not just him that says this. Many of them in, in, in the conscious community would agree that, you know, the netarus, the netters, aren't gods, but traits and attributes, right? So where would he get this from? Well, this should be familiar to many of you. Again, with Plutarch, as with all foreigners, the animal gods of Egypt were a sore stumbling block. And he is fain to pass them off as mere symbols or as utilitarian interpretations. See, Plutarch, mind, who, who fancied himself a comedic priest, couldn't read the metal netter and had, you know, a limited amount of knowledge about ancient Egypt, didn't like what he saw. Like, they can't, it can't really be, you know, actual gods. It has to be symbols, right? Um, but Greeks and Egyptians, or Egypto-Greeks, brought up under Hellenic influence desired, like Plutarch himself, to steer a middle course between atheism and superstition. Wherefore, the grosser side of Egyptian religion was dropped or treated symbolically. This is from P.D. Scott Moncrief, the Journal of Hellenic Studies, volume 29. Right? He didn't like it. It was icky to him what these black people actually believed. But it can't be this. So I'm going to clean it up for them. It, it, it must be symbols. Right? So again, this is uh, this is not indigenous to the people of actual ancient Kemet. This is this is again fanboy fiction from a white person who fancied himself a comedic priest, but had limited information and couldn't read the glyphs. So what he did was he put his own, you know, philosophy and used his only used Egypt as a centrifuge. For his own Platonism. Right? He wanted to show how great Platonism was. So he used what he thought of ancient Egypt symbolic some symbols to reinforce the virtues of his Platonism. You know, that's what's happening here. He, he's, he's actually a little racist here. Because what the black people believe in, nah, that's that's gross, he says. It's gross. It can't be that. It can't be an actual pantheon. It's got to be symbols. He sounds like most dudes I see on 125th Street in New York. They say the same thing about ancient Egypt. It's it's it's, it's crazy. MJ, your thoughts? Yeah, it's, once again, it seems to be a, a repackaging of European uh, thought. Um, a, a repackaging of colonized, right? Because what the what what the Hellenists did was colonize Egypt. Um, so you know, this this is just colonized thought. Um, but but I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about pantheism a little bit more, but but pan pantheism is, is is nothing new, but it's problematic. I mean, even for, for black people to let me just say this real quick, because we're gonna get into the ethics for a second. I'm gonna I'm at least touch on it. Sure. When, when Adam when Adam Coleman was on um, the platform with him, right? Adam was pointing to the ethical problems associated with pantheism, right? Because if everything is the divine force, even the man with his knee on George Floyd's neck. Is also part of the, the divine force. Right. That force is merely manifesting itself uh, as the knee on the neck. Right now, you can talk about how we have the devil, 
you could talk about how we have the devil and all that good stuff. Um, but the problem is God on the Christian worldview, it possesses a satiety. God is distinct from everything in creation. God is not a part of creation. God is separate from creation and cre creation uh, in the, in the intelligent portions of creation have what's called a free agency. They can act and therefore they are judged for their actions. And so when we look at these things, if you're sitting there on the fence, you got to sit back and at least ask the question, what is best explained? Um, what, what best explains the actions of racism, the actions of uh, crime, the actions of all kinds of deplorable uh, uh, things that we see in society? Is it best explained by the divine force manifesting these things? Or is it best explained in a more intelligent fashion that people with free agency are acting out of harmony with God's divine law. I think that you don't even have to be a Christian to see the value in the latter. Because if you if you subscribe to this this form of pantheism, you can't really be upset when your when your people have been oppressed for centuries. Because again, that's just another manifestation of the force, right? The transatlantic slave trade, that's just a, another manifestation of the force. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? So, but yeah, good point, MJ. Good point. So now, yeah, now it's going to get real interesting. If you can go to the 21 minute mark, sir. Um, in the in the comedic spiritual tradition. All right. So, could you talk about the Ankh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I, I'll talk first about my Ankh, right? So, when you're okay. a comedic priest, usually most comedic priests have a carrying Ankh, right? This one was crafted by Baba Heru. Um, it's it's silver, right? It's made of silver, um, and this, in many ways, is um, a commentary an acknowledgement of the fact that as a priest, I'm expected to have my life in my hand, right? That I'm, that this is, this is my title in many ways. And if he's me with my Ankh, they recognize I'm a priest and that I'm there for their assistance, right? Um, the Ankh itself is a, a powerful symbol. It's a powerful symbol. It is one of the most important symbols in ancient Africa. And it is uh, connected to, first of all, it's known to be the symbol of, of everlasting life. And there are lots of reasons why people say that it is structured in the way that it is. But one of the reasons is likely because this section here represents the female reproductive organ, reproductive unit. And then this represents the male organ and then together we see them combine to represent offspring. Um, there are some that argue about that definition. I would love, I, I was challenged once to argue and I said, well, if there, there are reasons why that's the case and if you wanna discuss it, let's discuss it. But definitely that's one of the reasons why. Stop it. Um, so let's discuss that, shall we? Let's discuss that. All right. This is from the Quick and the Dead, Biomedical Theory in Ancient Egypt by Andrew Gordon and Calvin Schwabe. As early as 1864, Brugush pointed out that ancient Egyptians endowed the spine with life-giving properties. Texts from the Old Kingdom on mention the back spine or the bones which comprise it, i.e. the neck, trunk, and tail vertebrae in context that suggests that all were believed to fulfill magical and, oh man, physiological physical, functions in reproduction and revivication of the dead. Now, remember, we're going back to the actual indigenous people. Like, what did they believe, right? What did they believe? So, all right, here we go. Thus, in Pyramid Text Utterance 336, 
the king says to the son, God, hail to you, bull of bulls, when you rise, I grasp you by your tail. I grip you by the root of your tail. As for my corpse, it is rejuvenated. And similarly, in Pyramid Text Utterance 539, quote, I will ascend and rise up to the sky. My spine is the wild bull. My vertebrae are the two in it. I will ascend and rise up to the sky. As in these examples, many such texts also refer to bulls. All right. So when it's, when it's time for them to to resurrect, in a sense, to come back, you know, through the duat and make it to the afterlife, the spine plays a major part. But it's also about bulls as well. There's a lot of talk about bulls and and spines. All right. In addition to these particular parts of the skeleton, the most durable part of the body uh, showed that in late text, semen was said to come from the interior of the bones generally. Okay, this is what these people believe. They believe that the spine played a major part in the emission of, of, of semen. Okay. These Egyptian beliefs about the spine and its role in, in reproduction are apparently central to a great deal of religious thought, especially in funerary contexts. Relevant texts are most concerned with extending or renewing the life of the deceased. In the first instance, the Pharaoh acts, which in a fused integrated society such as ancient Egypt, may also be considered the ultimate acts of preventative and curative medicine respectively. Not only do some of these otherwise obscure passages from the funerary lit literature become more understandable when examined in light of the Egyptians already apparent knowledge of the bull's anatomy and physiology, but in terms of further relationships that could not have escaped priests notice during frequently portrayed dissections of sacrificial bulls. If you was a comedic priest, this is something that you did. It was part and parcel of your ministry, right? D dissecting these bulls. And there was a connection with the spines and these, these mighty animals. So much so that they made their way into spells, right? These utterances to help someone to make it from here through the duat, right? They, there was a connection, and they, and they found a connection through the dissecting of these animals. All right? So, so I, hope, I hope you're tracking with me here. There's, there's, there's a lot. Clearly, some such reassembling of the body text, like semen from bone text, are intended to convey to the, to the deceased the power of gods or bulls. As examples, we see in Pyramid Text 2128b, 20, your spine is the door bolt of the God. And in um, Book of the Dead spell 42, you have come to it, Meryl of the elders. I am Ray, abiding a favor. I am God's vertebrae within the Talmudisk. My back is that of Seth. My phallus is that of Osiris. My belly and backbone are those of Sekhmet. Inter interesting in the context of bull anatomy, Specifically, our pyramid text 138C, 1313C, translated, my spine is that of a wild bull. My phallus is that of Apis, right? So this, this idea of revivifying a corpse and bringing back all its body parts, the way it was able to do that is if it had this, this spine of a bull, okay? There's this vertebrae. Evidence exists also that the Egyptians believe that not only were spinal bones especially rich sources of semen because of their more abundant marrow, but that particular sections of the spine were especially endowed with life's magic or serve other physiologic functions. <clears throat> now, I had to go into the screenshots because I, I need you to see the symbols here. Right? The particular importance of the thoracic vertebrae. Since bones, their marrow, and especially those to the spine were sources of life's magic as semen, a special relevance of elucidation of and explanations of for the origins of Egyptian theories about reproduction, 
Are origins of the other hieroglyphs more commonly used? And you see the different glyphs here, right? Words that meant back as well, uh, back medically for non-humans and for spine. Similarly interesting, we believe, are for gifts and three other hieroglyphs, right? So the, the glyphs are representative of vertebrae, right? Uh, it says they all represent usually four thoracic vertebrae of an ungulate mammal. In lateral perspective, with the bodies of the vertebrae indicated with the long spinous processes projecting dorsal cordially, animal origin of these is apparent since human thoracic vertebrae lack this process. Candidate animals indigenous to ancient Egypt include the wild bull, domestic bull, sheep, goat, ibex, and heart best um, are simplified or more hastily drawn versions of these same structures. All right, now, now we get to the meaning of the unk, right? Because we needed, we needed that backstory, we needed that context. We come now naturally to consideration of the actual symbol for life, living and related concepts, unk. And note that it is more or less the Kuhn veterinary papyrus uncommon ideogram written upside down. Treatment of Ankh showed that already in early dynastic times, it could be represented as an object made of something flexible, such as cloth or reed. However, his own exposition centers around a beautiful stone dish, probably a first dynasty, in the shape of an Ankh, a liquid, Fisher thought water, but put into the loop of the Ankh and then poured through the stem in a life-giving ritual. The Ankh symbol, as he pointed out, frequently associated with lustrations, but as we shall argue in chapter seven, this liquid may as well originally have been semen or its female analog milk. As to the object which the onk sign was derived originally, we are looking for something that has a loop at one end, projections to either side, and a straight shank from the loop, and which is associated with life-giving properties. An obvious candidate, based on the above, is a single thoracic vertebrae of the bull. And here, figure 6-2, one of the larger of the thoracic vertebrae of a bull shown in cordial perspective. Note its long spinous process <coughs> with slightly flared end portion in median line, the two lateral processes, and the vertebrae canal through which passes the spinal cord. What does that look like to you? MJ? Looks like broccoli. It looks like broccoli, right? But <laughs> also it looks like the unk. Yeah, it looks like the unk. The unk, right? If the unk was originally an ungulate thoracic vertebrae, which ungulate? Bulls and rams were both prominent among Egyptian fertility gods. And in the late semen from bone text discussed by Surion, the ram god Kahun is frequently the actor, or in one instance, the Rambo Mendes, another fertility god. However, in noting the several implied relationships of the spine and its bones to the process of revivification after death, beginning in old kingdom texts, one cannot fail to be struck by the frequent association of both the back and its bones and the process with bulls. Thus, while thoracic vertebrae of both rams and bulls closely resemble the ant symbol, the most substantial evidence, including that already presented, favors a particular connection of Ankh's origin with the bull. Mm. Why is that a big deal? Well, not for us. But, you know, for someone who has made the claim of being a, a chief priest of a shrine. And when someone asks the priest what he holds in his hand, why doesn't he say this? Now, he is within the ballpark, right? Because he says that it's life, you know, and it has something to do with reproduction. That's true. But then he goes into, well, this is the female and this is the male, and that together they form the child. I could understand that from a layperson. But he's not a layperson, now, is he? He's clergy. He holds this in his hand. And he's been holding this in his hand for years. And you don't know what it is? 
You don't know what it is. Right? But if you look back at Old Kingdom texts, and you look at the pyramid texts, and the coffin texts, and the Book of the Dead, you can gather the data to realize, so also, this is where the symbol comes from. It's a thoracic vertebrae of a bull because these indigenous people believe that the spine, that part, emitted semen, which, of course, brings forth life. Right? To the mind of the ancient comedic person, that made perfect sense to them. So that's why the symbol is that because it represented strength. It represented divinity. It represented, you know, being, you know, just just fertile, right? It, it's it's this bone, this backbone, is the causation of the continuation of life, according to how they saw it. But that's not what Jabari said, now, is it? No, he gave. I've heard that same breakdown from Erica Badu. <laughs> the same breakdown. I've I've heard all of them say it that way. I never heard anybody say this because they don't go back to the ancient text as much as they love to talk about it, right? Side note, do you see any of this in the Bible? Because they always talk about the Bible as a ripoff of these texts. Are we doing anything like this in the Bible? No. Absolutely not. You know, so again, not that we care about the Ankh in that manner. But the reason why we bring that up is people will leave the, the church and leave Christianity because they want an authentic African experience. But what we see here, for one, the best and the brightest, that's not what's happening here. And I think sincere in his mind, his heart, he thinks he is. But when you look, when you take a little bit of time and research, none of this is African. It's just, it's just not. Right? Is, is this your priest? Is this your king? Is this your king? A man who was moved by an author who used hermeticism. Once he was moved by that, he ran into the arms of black theosophy. None of this is African. And I don't doubt his love for the continent. He loves it. He's been there like more than 20 times. He loves Africa and he loves African people. Don't doubt it. But when it comes to his pursuit of African spirituality, that's not what's happening here. He might think it is, but when you do a little bit, when you dig a little deep, it's not. And if you want, and not that you, it's, it's, a, it's important to have a quote unquote African experience, but if you do want one, I got something for you. It's called the gospel. Because <laughs> we've been there from day one. We've been there from day one. Come get this gospel, and you'll get more than just an African experience. You'll get that hole that's in your in your heart filled. So, MJ. That's some good preaching right there, man. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, like once again, I, I agree with you. Uh, I believe that the man is sincere. I also believe he's invested into what he believes as well. And um, that could be pretty tough to uh, the pressure that comes from that could be pretty tough to, to, to look at it and say, well, you know, based on uh, based on this new evidence and information it's not just evidence and information uh also you know the heart has to change but <laughs> but i think it was rc sproul that said this that the heart cannot receive what the mind does not believe to be true as well so i mean it's, it's a heart issue and it's also a head issue as well now we've dealt the the, the head issue can be dealt with by just a good historical method and when you practice good historiography you you'll see uh the merits of jesus christ being who he claimed to be and who he was claimed to be as well 
um, as far as the heart issue, um, you know, we'll just keep praying for the brother, right? We'll keep praying for him. And, I, you know, I pray for a lot of folks in the conscious community. Right. Um, probably wouldn't be a good career choice. But if you love truth, if you love black people, got to tell them the truth. And the more that we keep digging behind these different ideologies, the more that we find that it's, it's not unique to Africa at all. It's not. It's repackaged uh, Eurocentrism and blackface. That's all yep. it is. Yep. That's it. And it's therapy. Right. Therapy that doesn't cure you of your psychosis. It's patchwork at best. It's a little band-aid on a gaping wound that only God can heal. And yeah, to your point, MJ... Like I like Jabari. I actually do. I, I think he's a smart guy. I think he would be an amazing addition to the body. He really would. You know? And the fact that if a book could jar him that way, that tells me your heart is soft. Right? Like you're you're looking, you're looking for something to change you. You know? And if he still has that same heart, man, I, I just hope that through these various videos that he could see that, you know. You can have that that deep spiritual experience through the gospel, you know, and be more than happy to sit down with him if he ever wants to, you know, do that, you know. Um, so, yeah, you know, because from, from from everybody on that side, he's the one of the few that you can actually sit down and have a conversation with, you know, and I, and I, I would look forward to that if, if it's at all possible. And no, you don't eat fried chicken and chitlins. None or, of that. I or eat K, or smoke K two. I don't smoke anything. You know, <laughs> I am plant based. You know, I'll have the occasional drink with you if you want to drink. I, I drink with you. I, I most I don't smoke, but I definitely will have a drink with you. So, so that being said, uh, MJ, any any final thoughts before we out of here, bro? Now this this was fun. Uh, we'll we'll have to. Dig a little deeper into John G. Jackson. He'll be fun. Sure. Uh, he'll be fun to, to talk about if if you uh, deem it necessary to continue. Yeah. Is, this your king, is, is this your King series? Uh, I know you like to keep these things about out. I think John G. Jackson might, just, you know, he might need at least two sessions because, you know, he he is within the canon, the, the anti-Christian oh, hotep canon. So, uh, absolutely, he's definitely a king, he's definitely a yeah. pillar. So, so yeah, guys, thank you for for coming through. Uh, I hope this was edifying and encouraging. Um, encouraging in, in the fact that if you have made Jesus Lord, you have made the right decision. Because as you can see, there's people out here looking, looking to fill that hole, and they'll go through and 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 listen to all. Of, sorts of various things but you guys chose the gospel you know and you chose right there's no need for you to doubt don't waver in your allegiance because when you look at this other stuff it's it's, it's there's nothing that should move you from your post when it comes to the gospel right so that being said mj and bk we out of here peace